She didn't even flinch. There wasn't. I often wonder how a person can sleep at night after taking so many helpless babies' lives. The following stories tell the tale of some of the most insane and terrifying female killers to ever exist. We have a woman who partnered with her husband to kill innocent girls, a nurse who killed babies for no reason, and yet another woman who killed eight members of her own family. Stay tuned. Twenty five Cromwell Street in Gloucester has become one of the most infamous addresses in Britain. For twenty years, Fred and Rose West quenched their appetite for sex and murder inside this house of unimaginable horror. Rose West and her husband Fred are some of the most horrific people you could ever imagine. They got their kicks off of abusing and killing helpless girls. But what made them this way? How did they become so sickeningly evil and inhumane? Let's take a look back at the history of this couple and try to find out. This story starts getting pretty disturbing early on. It's the year 1969 and Fred West is 28 years old with a wife and a family of his own, but he secretly had his eyes set on a girl who was only 15 years old. Her name was Rose. Rose and her family had only recently moved to the area where Fred had been brought up. Fred was the oldest boy in his family and he came from a history of very severe abuse at the hands of his own mother who took advantage of him physically. His mother said everything essentially and he lost his virginity to her and the family was a very self-contained one. Rose's childhood was similar to Fred's in many ways. So it's very clear that both of these individuals had very twisted childhoods, but what effect did that have on them growing up? Well, Fred decided to go on to pursue Rose despite her being just a minor at the time. They ended up meeting at a bus station, and though Rose admitted that Fred wasn't the best kept man there ever was, she was still attracted to him, and part of the attraction was that they both shared very similar pasts. Maybe it was something that Rose gave off implicitly, but something in Fred connected with what had happened to Rose, and the way she was, and the way she'd been treated by her father. And so Fred ended up moving in with Rose along with his own stepdaughter. Before long, they were pregnant with their first child, a girl named Heather. For Rose and Fred, it was all about sex from the very, very beginning. Fred was the originator, but he found the perfect sorcerer's apprentice. Two decades went by and the couple remained together, but then something shocking happened among their family. Gloucestershire police are searching for Heather West. In 1987, aged just 16, Fred and Rose's eldest child vanished from the family home. Fred had claimed Heather had run away, but she was never reported as missing. However, the police had been aware that there were some allegations that child abuse was occurring inside Rose and Fred's home, so they started an investigation looking into where Heather could be. One of Fred and Rose's children had told a friend at school about abuse that was occurring within the home, and that friend went and told the police officer. Before long, they had enough evidence to remove the five West children from the home. The rumor that was going around the neighborhood was that Fred had killed Heather and buried her beneath an outdoor patio. So many people talked about this theory that eventually, the police began to wonder if there could be any truth to it. Despite massive amount of inquiry to try and find out she just literally disappeared off the face of the earth could heather really be buried beneath the patio not knowing where else to look they decided to get a warrant to dig it up when they arrived with the warrant fred and rose were at the house and they went into the back garden and the officers started uh, digging the garden the following day officers digging in that area recovered a femur um, and uh, that was taken for examination by the forensic pathologist. It was confirmed that, sure enough, the remains belonged to Heather. At the time that Heather's remains were located, Rose was at the police station being questioned. She seemed very shocked when she got the news. At that time, I, I believe that she was shocked and distressed. The police could have never expected that they would end up finding when they digged up that patio. There were more than just two leg bones under there. This meant that there was someone else under there, 
in addition to Heather. When they brought this up to Fred, he wasn't surprised. Ah, oh, yes, Fred says, without drawing breath or hesitating, that must be the other girl, that would be Shirley. The more the police searched, the more they found. There were clearly many secrets that had been hidden at 25 Cromwell Street. Fred told the investigating officers the other body was of his former lover, Shirley Robinson. West also admitted that police would find a third body in the garden. Throughout the questioning, he insisted on one thing, that his wife, Rose, knew nothing about any of the bodies. But how is it possible that all of this could have been going on in the family home without Rose having a single clue? As police try to unravel what could have happened, it becomes clear that this is a very complicated and confusing case. To make things worse, Fred kept changing his story over and over again. He would go from denying the kids altogether to saying that they were accidental, likely in an attempt to get charged with manslaughter instead of murder. It's very difficult when somebody's been buried for years to look at them in detail as a pathologist. You haven't got the skin, you haven't got the muscles, you haven't got the organs, the things that you'd see injury or disease in. Because Fred's victims had been dead for so long, it would be nearly impossible to figure out how they had died. They also had a hard time identifying the third victim that was found buried in the yard. By using dental records, experts identified the third victim as Alison Chambers, who was just 16 when she went missing in 1979. There were markings on Alison that proved that she had been tortured and was the victim of intimate violence before her death. This added a lot to the case because it showed that Fred wasn't just a killer, he was incredibly cruel and made these murders incredibly horrific and painful. As more information about these horrible murders was gathered, it became less and less believable that Rose couldn't have known what was happening. It would appear inconceivable that she wouldn't have had knowledge of this. Police began to wonder if there could be more victims beyond the three bodies they had located so far. So they began to look into local missing person cases. This was an impossibly large search. We were dealing with forensic materials, I mean, massive amounts of forensic material, searching. It was on a scale that was really unprecedented. Eventually, police were able to determine two missing women who stood out. One was 21-year-old student Lucy Partington. She went missing from a bus stop. The other was Linda Goh, a 19-year-old who went missing the same year. Police found out that Fred and Rose actually worked together to lure their victims. They would identify young women on the run, if you like. They were vulnerable. They would offer them a home. Fred and Rose would specifically look for women that looked young, vulnerable, and a little lost. Working as a couple made things easier for them because people were more likely to trust Rose since she was a woman. They believed they would be safe with her. Rose already knew the language of grooming. She was quite used to it. And when you hear the victims talk about how she spoke to them in this sort of quite soft, pleasing voice. Police needed help in prosecuting Rose, and this help came in the form of a woman named Caroline Roberts. She contacted police and told them that in 1972, she had been physically violated by both Fred and Rose. They had picked her up while she had been hitchhiking. She also worked for them as a nanny for a little while. They invited her back to the house. She was then bound and subject to, to some rather aggressive sexual activity. She managed to escape subsequently and reported it to her mum, who then told the police. The pair were both arrested and charged with rape. At the time, Caroline had been too afraid to face them during the trial. Ultimately, Fred and Rose's charges were reduced and they were given a fine, but no prison time. With the information Caroline gave to the police, they could link Rose to the crimes and bodies at Cromwell Street. Police now knew that these things were intimate in nature. Fines and gags were used on the victims, and Fred and Rose worked together to carry out the dangerous assault. Police believed that there could be a lot more hidden on the Cromwell Street house, and so they decided to move their investigation further into the house. On March 4th of 1994, their search led them down a dark cellar. It was there they located even more bodies. That same day, Fred handed over a handwritten note to police in which he made a startling admission. 
I, Frederick West, authorize my solicitor, Howard Ogden, to advise Superintendent Bennett that I wish to admit to a further approx nine things. Expressly, Charmaine, Rena, Linda Goff, and others to be identified. The admission brought the total victims up to a startling 10. It's at that point the police realize that they are dealing with someone truly evil. Police ended up taking Fred back to the house where he helped them identify more of the bodies. All the while, he continued to say that Rose had nothing to do with the murders. It would turn out that the two of them had made a pact. Fred would take the blame for the murders, but she would stand by him and visit him in prison. They thought that one day, he might be a free man again. But things didn't go as Fred might have expected because Rose betrayed him. But the minute Rose heard that he'd actually admitted to the murders, then she dropped him and she absolutely refused to have any contact with him. The media presence at Fred and Rose's home was insane. The nation was absolutely shocked by the atrocity of these murders and wanted to know everything there was to know about this twisted couple. Police continued to recover more and more of Fred and Rose's victims, including Therese Seinelthaler, who was 21 years old at the time of her death. There were also remains of Shirley Hubbard, who was just 15. It was clear to pathologists that much had been done to try and hide the identity of all the murdered girls. Police were still looking for Fred's wife, Rena West, who was last seen in 1971 at the age of 27. They asked for his help in identifying her, and he pointed them in the direction of a field near the West home. It was there that she was discovered. Meanwhile, slowly but surely, police continued to exhume more bodies in the Cromwell House cellar. Another victim was identified as Juanita Mott. Juanita was just 18 years old when she went missing in 1975. There was also Carol Ann Cooper, who was 15 years old when she went missing while walking back from the movies in 1973. It's almost incomprehensible that two people could uh, abduct young women or uh, lure them to the house and subsequently, uh, you know, them and, and then kill them. Eventually, police managed to recover the bodies of all 10 victims. It's very difficult to try to understand how this could have happened and why. Who would want to hurt innocent people in this way? It seemed to come down to the ways in which both Fred and Rose were raised and the abuse that they suffered. They had been hurt, and now they wanted to hurt others. Everything he did was with Rose's help. And the thought of having some young woman hung up in the cellar, literally, almost defies belief. It is that horrifying. Both Fred and Rose were jailed while awaiting trial. But the police needed more evidence if they wanted to truly prove that Rose took part in the murders. They wouldn't be able to get any more information out of Fred because he took his own life behind bars before ever even going to trial. It seems almost appropriate that a man accused of taking so many people's lives should end up taking his own. Fred's suicide threw a major wrench in the case. The police knew that they needed to get justice for the victims and their families, which included making sure that Rose would pay for her role in all of this. They couldn't mess this up. Still, many were really worried that the charges against her would be dropped. The trial against Rose caused such a media frenzy. It wasn't common for women to go to trial, much less to go to trial for the murders of 10 different people. Throughout the trial, she continued to claim her innocence, saying that it had been Fred behind all of this and that she had taken no part in it. But at the end of all of this, the prosecution was able to prove to the jury that Rose was truly guilty. When the first guilty verdicts came back, Rose did not flicker, not a sign of emotion. And I was left with the overwhelming feeling that one had been in the presence of someone who had lost contact with humanity. Rose was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Finally, justice had been served. She remains behind bars and is now 69 years old. If you thought this story was crazy, 
Wait till you hear the next story of yet another horrific female killer. I trusted you with my daughter, and you would tell me it's gonna be okay with Mary. You should have to serve one year for every year of life you robbed from the babies that you murdered. I often wonder how a person can sleep at night after taking so many helpless babies' lives. We all want to know why, and I don't know if we ever will. Janine Jones, who is known as the killer nurse, pleaded guilty to new murder charges this morning. Paul Venema, who's been following the Jones case since her initial conviction in 1984, tells us what he's learned about a possible plea deal. Who could possibly take the life of a newborn? Someone who has barely even had a taste of life yet. Even further, who could do it as many as 60 different times? The answer is Janine Jones, and she is known as the killer nurse, an American serial killer that, strangely, many people haven't heard about. She would inject multiple different bad substances into babies to kill them. It certainly was the most disturbing case I'd ever covered. How could you do something like this to an innocent child? You took Makad's most precious gift babies, defenseless, innocent. Janine worked as a nurse in Texas during the 70s and 80s. To her patients, she seemed caring, compassionate, and charming. They were grateful for her care and attention. But staff at the hospital where she worked had their suspicions that there was a darker side to her. This is due to the sheer number of babies that were dying under her care. Something wasn't adding up. Dr. Holland, who was a, a brand new uh, pediatrician, just opened her practice, was, was in search of a nurse, and, and hired Janine Jones uh, immediately for her pediatric clinic in Kerrville. And in a period of one month, eight kids had nine separate emergencies and were rushed to the ER because they had stopped breathing. That was pretty hard to miss. These babies were coming in for non-serious medical reasons. They could have been in for a routine checkup or for a cold, they might not have been showing any symptoms at all, only to end up dead with no explanation. They would simply stop breathing. One of Janine's victims was a 15-month-old infant named Chelsea McCland. When Chelsea began showing respiratory distress after being in Janine's care, the child was rushed to another doctor, who quickly noticed that the child seemed to be under the effect of a medication called Sucline-Choline. Succinylcholine is a muscle paralytic that is usually used to paralyze someone's muscles for surgery or if they have to be intubated or something like that. Um, if you were to inject it in a person, in a baby, um, it would just paralyze all of their muscles, including the diaphragm. Without the ability to move the diaphragm, the person cannot breathe and will shortly die, which is what happened in Chelsea's case. Inquiries are made in Dr. Holland's office, and they find out that in fact she did have suction of choline in her office. It had been ordered by her nurse, Janine Jones. Upon inspection, Dr. Holland is saying that she has never prescribed it. She then checked her supply of suction of choline and found that there had been a bottle of uh, a vial of suction of choline missing. She asked uh, Jones about it. She said, I don't know what happened to it. Just say we lost it. The doctor went back to where the medicine was being kept, and sure enough, a bottle of this exact same medicine had recently been punctured. This had been done intentionally. But at the time that this occurred, there was not the types of testing and technology that are available today. There wasn't an easy way to detect for a fact that this substance was in Chelsea's body and led to her death. So instead, it was classified initially as Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. However, as time went on, they located a doctor who was able to test muscle tissue for the substance. So Chelsea's body was exhumed so it could be tested. The first thing that I noticed immediately was the smell. Uh, and I know that's difficult to say, but uh, that was my first experience with smelling decomposition. The body was tested and sure enough, this substance was found within her system. Now finally, Janine Jones was charged with murder and injury to a child. The trial was incredibly disturbing and emotional. 
especially when Chelsea's mother took to the stand to describe the events that happened. It was said that every single person in the courtroom cried at the testimony, including the judge. But Janine shed no tears. In February of 1984, Janine was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 99 years behind bars. Ronnie Sutton was the prosecutor out there in Kerrville. He said that the jury at the time said that if they could have given her the death penalty, they would have. They just couldn't. Later that year, she was charged with killing yet another child, Rolando Santos, by using a different substance. She was given an additional 60 years behind bars. Today, we know that prior to her conviction, Janine claimed the lives of many, many other children. And in fact, she actually took a plea deal and pled guilty to another murder in 2020, that of Joshua Sawyer. Unfortunately, she was only ever convicted of two murders. Part of this is because hospitals where she worked destroyed their records to avoid getting into trouble. She is now 72 years old and will potentially be eligible for parole at the age of 87. Finally, it is over. That is what the mother of one of the five infants that Janine Jones, known as the nurse, said following Jones's sentencing today. As part of a plea agreement, Jones sentenced to life in prison. The parents of the victims had a chance to address Janine in court. I will leave you with this. I hope for you to live a long and miserable life behind bars. She appeared stone-faced and unemotional as the sentencing took place. The family members of the victims were visibly distressed. Nobody knows this pain I carry, only I. <laughs> and finally it's over. Some family members took comfort in the fact that even though Janine took their loved ones away from them, she will continue to live out her days in a cell. Even though my brother is in a box, she's going to spend the rest of her life in a box, too. So I, I can smile today knowing that. If the story of Janine Jones shocked you, we have yet one more story of a sick female killer that is likely to do the same. As an adult, Nanny Doss was eventually given the nickname the Giggling Grandma a misnomer, as this was a very dark and evil woman. She was also called by some media outlets Arsenic Annie, a far more accurate and concise nickname for this infamous serial killer. After her capture, Nanny Doss would later tell interviewers that her life was made up of an eternal search for, quote, the real romance of life. The price of this supposed eternal search would be in the form of the lives of Nanny's four husbands, of two of her children, of her two sisters, her mother, her nephew, and her infant grandson. This is the story of someone who is the exact opposite of who you would want watching your kids. Nancy Hazel, who was called Nanny, was born in 1905 and had three sisters and a brother. She grew up working on the family farm instead of going to school. When she was seven, she suffered a head injury when she was riding on a train that came to a sudden stop. This resulted in her suffering from depression and frequent headaches later in life. She would later blame her future actions on this accident. Nanny was not allowed to attend social events or wear makeup as her father believed these things would lead her to be taken advantage of by men. She ended up getting married at just 16 years old to a man she hardly knew. The two had four daughters together but lost two of them to what was at the time suspected to be food poisoning. It was not a happy marriage and the two would later separate. He would end up telling others that he left because he was afraid of his own wife. The pair would later divorce. Nanny's second marriage was to a man named Robert. They were married for 16 years until he died. It was later revealed that she had put rat poison in his whiskey after he had forced himself on her. She then collected his $500 life insurance policy. Melvina, one of Nanny's remaining children, gave birth to a son who also happened to be named Robert. Just two years later, she gave birth to another son. After giving birth, she was loopy and exhausted. She recalled watching her mother stick a hat pin into her newborn's head, but wasn't sure if what she had seen was real because she had been so tired at the time. Later on, Melvina and her mother were in a fight, but she left her son Robert in Nanny's care. 
Meanwhile, she went to visit with her father. When she returned, she would find out that the child had of asphyxia while in Nanny's care. Nanny didn't explain how Robert had died. You would think at this point, people would have surely had to have been getting suspicious of Nanny. After all, people were dying around her left and right. Something wasn't adding up. Unfortunately, if people were suspicious, they didn't notify the proper authorities. Nanny would end up marrying a third time, this time to a man named Arlie, who she met just three days prior. It was not a good relationship. He had a drinking problem and was gone for days on end. He ended up dying from what she said was at the time to be heart failure. Arlie had left the house he shared with Nanny to go to his sister's, but the home ended up burning down in a supposed accidental fire, and the insurance money was pocketed by Nanny. This was yet another suspicious occurrence in which a tragedy somehow ended up benefiting Nanny. But it didn't end there. Not long after that, her mother and sister both passed away from unknown causes. Single once more, Nanny was on the hunt for her fourth husband and met a man named Richard Morton. She probably hoped that this would finally be the loving relationship she was always hoping for, but it was anything but, and Richard ended up cheating on her. He then wound up dead after being poisoned at the hands of Nanny. In 1953, Nanny married a fifth time to a man named Samuel. But Samuel didn't share the same interests as her, and sure enough, he ended up poisoned as well. After his death, his suspicious doctor ordered for an autopsy to be completed on him, and it was discovered that his body was full of poison, arsenic. Nanny was soon after arrested. While in custody, Nanny confessed to the murders of her four former husbands, her mom, her sister, her grandson, and her mother-in-law. She was given life in prison. This was the default sentence at the time as women were not eligible for the death penalty. She passed away while behind bars at the age of 60 in 1965. And so there we have it, three heartless female killers who took the lives of innocents. Who do you think of all of these was the most evil? Let us know in the comments. True crime cases can get particularly scary when nothing is as it seems. Watch closely as this woman receives her sentence. We, the jury, find the defendant, Ezra J. McCandless, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide as charged in the information. Does she look guilty to you? What about this one? Having reviewed the evidence and applied the law thereto, now finds you guilty on the indictment charging you with the involuntary man of the person Conrad Roy III. Indeed, we're used to women being the victims of so many vile monsters. But what happens when a cold-blooded killer hides behind a pretty face? Otherwise, let's dive in. Today's case begins on March 22nd, 2018, with a frantic knock on a farmer's door. When he opens the door, he found an agitated woman desperate to come inside. This was Eau Claire, Wisconsin. This is a gorgeous town of some 70,000 people. Its name literally means clear water, and it's not exactly wrong. It's a beautiful, peaceful place. So when the farmer, Don Sippel, found the young woman on his doorstep, he wasn't expecting trouble. This wasn't the kind of place where people are used to crime, but everything was off about that girl. She was covered in blood and mud. She wore no shoes and she was full of bruises. Don invited her in and called 911, asking an ambulance to come and offer some help to this poor girl. This is Don Schiffel calling and I have a, a young lady that just came to my house and somebody attacked her and she needs a doctor. Her, her clothes are all torn and... And what is the address you're located at? What? What is the address you are at? E7614, 430th Avenue. Okay. And is she injured? Yeah, she's injured. Her, her mouth has kind of uh, got some blood around it, and her clothes are all torn. If that wasn't off enough, listen to her reaction when the dispatcher wants to know her name. My 
calls here just recently. Okay, and can you ask her what her name is? Just hold on a second. Okay. What's your name, ma'am? What? You don't know? She's in kind of bad shape. She just says she don't know. Do you know how you're supposed to help the police find your attacker? Well, in Ezra's case, she was anything but cooperative. With Dawn, she would cry and refuse to answer any questions, saying she was just in a state of shock. This behavior continued with the officers when they arrived at Dawn's farmhouse. But when the police took her to the hospital and pressed her for a name, she gave them the name of the attacker, Alex Woodworth, her ex-boyfriend. But she wouldn't say anything else, and she insisted that the cops brought someone to be with her, a certain Jason Mengel. He was her current boyfriend or some sort of love affair that she seemed to have at the moment. But before the investigators did anything to please this mysterious, non-talkative woman in distress, they decided to do some digging. Ezra J. McCandless was born on October 6, 1997, to a 14-year-old mother. Her actual name was Monica Kay, but when she was a teenager, she became obsessed with the Into the Wild character, Alex McCandless. Alex was a social outcast who left society to live in the wild. Eventually, he starved to death. But that didn't mean much to Monica. She wanted to become Alex McCandless. So when she turned 18, she changed her last name to McCandless, honoring her favorite character. This is also when she moved to EU Claire. Ezra also started identifying as a boy, but soon switched back to being a girl again. Then she became passionate about art and would post about her projects online. Her life changed in 2017 when she met an Army Reserve medic called Jason Mengel. He was 13 years her senior, but seemed like a match made in heaven, at least at the beginning. After eight months of passionate dating, the two moved in together and started talking about marriage. During these happy times, they would spend many of their evenings at Racy's, a downtown coffee shop in EU Claire. This is when Ezra's eyes fell on Alex Woodworth. Alex was 23 years old. He worked part-time as a barista at Racy's, and he also worked as a substitute teacher. Teaching was his dream and his qualification, but he dreamt of exiting the school system and teaching university-level philosophy. Alex was the dreamy, friendly, animal-loving guy that Jason wasn't. But if you're going to start a new relationship, just break up with your partner, right? Well, Ezra decided to have an affair with Alex, unbeknownst to Jason. Ezra would also brag to her friends that her new relationship had a kinky BDSM layer to it. But it wasn't too long before Jason found out, so he gave her an ultimatum, a classic me or him. However, Ezra replied, none. She broke up with them both. Soon after, in February 2018, Jason left for a two-week military training. He came back on March 1st, only to find a very distressed Ezra at home. She told him she'd been sexually assaulted by one of his best friends. That day, Jason rushed to the police station to report the incident. Needless to say, the police wanted to get a statement from the victim herself. And I got really, really, really drunk. Almost blacked up drunk, and I was throwing up. And he had me go upstairs when I started throwing up, and he took me upstairs, and he put me in his bed, and I was throwing up. <sighs> I just remember a lot of, I don't know, it's a big mess of a bunch of fumbling and stuff. It was awful. Did you tell Jason what happened? I told him everything tonight. Okay, but at that time they have to tell. Okay. Ezra said she didn't report the incident when it happened because she was ashamed and afraid. This is not far-fetched. Many sexual assault victims feel this way afterward. But the police decided to look into Ezra's phone records anyways to gain some more information about the attacker. And they found the many flirty, suggestive texts she had sent him. But Ezra never mentioned those. She just made it sound like it was a sudden attack. 
Ezra also told the cops that she had slept with Alex a few times while Jason was away on military training. So the officers spoke to Alex. And here's another plot twist. Alex said she knew about Ezra sleeping with another guy, but it was consensual. She just told Alex that she regretted sleeping with him. Well, that's a pretty nasty move. The police dropped the investigation case as it was pretty clear that this was just Ezra being Ezra. But now she wanted to get back together with Jason. In fact, she hoped that painting herself as a victim might help her win him back. But Jason saw through her lies and found out that she was still seeing Alex, so this time he broke up with her and told her to leave the apartment. So in March 2018, Ezra went back to living with her parents, but she wasn't done with Jason or Alex. Her mind was now set on revenge. On March 22nd, Jason was having a cup of coffee at Racy's. That's when Ezra popped in and surprised him. He had no idea she was in town. She wanted to show Alex her newest art, she said. She drove her car to Alex's apartment building, but Jason had a really weird feeling about Ezra's plan. Something in her voice sounded dishonest. So he cycled over to Alex's home, then proceeding to cycle around the block, wondering whether to go in or not. At this point, a local janitor saw this and dialed 911, thinking Jason was suspicious. But Jason ended up speaking to the cops on the phone, explaining the situation. It's my girlfriend's car, or okay. my ex-girlfriend. We're kind of in a situation, and since you talked to me this morning, I was worried because the guy that lives there is involved in an assault case that she's with. Or, or I mean, she's the victim of? She's the victim of an assault that happened, and when she went to him for consolement, I was gone on military orders. Jason went on to explain the whole situation between them, as complicated as it was. But the bottom line was, he was worried she was going to do something bad to or with Alex. Some stuff, and I was paranoid because she had like fire in her eyes. Okay. So, I who's who's the girlfriend? Ezra McCandless. Okay. I was just worried because like, was the door standing open over there when you? got there on the knocked, car? I knocked like three times. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear a scuffle or okay. anything. So knocked, knocked, yelled, opened the door, and I heard her say, let him help you. Let him help you. So then I said, hey, is everything okay? Is everyone all right right now? Jason eventually said he was probably just being paranoid because he's a military doctor, so he's used to seeing weird incidents. That afternoon, the police caught up with Ezra and made sure that she and Alex were fine. Are you here? Okay. Somebody called us kind of worried because they saw Jason come over here and yeah. he was going in the car and they weren't sure what was going on. No, no. everything's fine. Everything's fine? Okay. Jason cycled away, the police drove off, and Ezra was left with Alex in her car. Within an hour, Ezra killed Alex. Skip ahead a few hours to Ezra being interrogated. Remember she had turned up on Don's doorstep, covered in blood and mud, pointing her finger at Alex, but saying nothing more? She said she didn't remember how she got into a fight with Alex, she didn't remember how or where or when he attacked her, or what happened afterward. When the cop asked her how she got to Don's farmhouse, she said, I just kind of felt like I woke up and I was scared, so I was just walking down the road. Like, what do you remember about that? I, mean, I remember being cold. Okay. Ezra might have been in shock, right? But when detectives set out to find Alex Woodworth, he was nowhere to be found. So they went to Don's farmhouse and tracked Ezra's muddy footprints from there. It was a pretty clear path all the way to her artsy car. There was a body hanging out of the back seat. Alex had been stabbed 16 times. Then Ezra discarded him on the back seat and ran to the nearest house, claiming she'd been assaulted by the very man she'd just murdered. When the police confronted Ezra about the body, she suddenly seemed to remember the attack. She said Alex carved the word boy into her arm as a reminder that she once identified as a boy. The detective simply asked Ezra to confirm the positions in the car again. She said she was driving and Alex was in the passenger seat. So how did he grab her left arm with his right arm and carve it while she was driving? That's when Ezra admitted it to doing it herself. 
Then she completely changed her story. She said that they were sitting in the back seat when Alex pulled out a knife, attacked her, cut off her clothing, and tried to violate her. So she managed to grab his knife and hit him 16 times. If you grab a knife from an attacker, you usually hurt your hands really bad. Ezra didn't have any injuries on her hands, and Alex also had no defensive wounds on his body, and he'd been outside Ezra's car. Her car was completely clean on the inside. Ezra's lies came to an end in April 2018 when she was arrested and charged with first-degree intentional murder. During her trial in 2020, Ezra maintained that she was an innocent victim of a horrific assault and that she simply defended herself from Alex, just like her dad had taught her. What I recall my dad telling me, he told me many times and he would always tell me, when you're in a situation with an individual or if someone's attacking you, that you need to do anything and everything you can to get away, to defend yourself. And he would tell me about, you can use knives, you can scratch, you can kick, you can fight. Then Jason came in to testify, and you can see an interesting reaction here. She hadn't seen him for 18 months, and she couldn't hide her happiness. But his testimony did not help her. Um, why did you go looking for the defendant? Something did not seem right. After three hours of deliberation, the jury had a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Ezra J. McCandless, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide as charged in the information. Before she received her sentence, Ezra expressed a long, tearful apology to Alex's family. Hey, how sorry I am that they have lost their son. But sorry doesn't cut it in my mind. That word is not enough and never will be enough for this loss. And I recognize that. There might have been a few crocodile tears, but the judge was very clear about her sentence. She boiled over at some point and killed Alex Woodworth. And uh, it was not in self-defense. And she lied about what happened, which is frankly not that uncommon. Uh, I am gonna sentence Ms. McCannis to uh, uh, life in prison in the Wisconsin prison system, and I'm going to uh, set the date that she would be eligible for uh, petitioning the court for extended supervision at 50 years. It's a long time, but the way I reason this, that Ms. McCandless, if she does what she's supposed to do, uh, follows the rules, uh, that she at least has some light at the end of a very long tunnel. Indeed, if you can't follow the rules in life, then you're gonna learn to do so in prison. But Ezra, didn't seem ready to learn any lessons. On her Instagram page, dirt underscore find, she wrote a long post about how she and her family will never stop until she gets justice. And in her mind, justice is a new chance at a free life, as she is not guilty of murdering Alex Woodworth. It's a tragic, senseless case. An innocent life was taken just because a deranged killer wanted to get back together with an ex who didn't want her anymore. Sadly, it'll probably be a long time until Ezra changes her violent, dishonest ways. Our next story takes place in Mattaposet, Massachusetts. It's home to just over 6,000 sea-loving people. A tiny, peaceful town full of boats and windproof hats. In 2014, Massaposet was the home of 18-year-old Conrad Roy. Just like his family, he was into boating and an avid supporter of the Red Sox. Conrad spent a lot of time cooped up in his room, recording his inner struggles. This is Conrad Henry Roy III, reporting to you about what's going on through my mind, what's going on through my head the last few days. What I am doing is looking at myself so negatively. Despite his royal name, Conrad had a rough start in life. Through a number of issues. His parents divorced. There was allegedly some domestic violence in their relationship. His grades were really struggling in school. He had a history of depression and anxiety. In fact, he had been hospitalized previously for a suicide attempt. By the summer of 2014, Conrad was at a really low point in his life. He was 18, yet he was completely alone. He saw his peers coupling up or heading off to new states or countries for school. 
So he felt more and more of an outcast. The face of this earth is no good. Trash. Will never be successful. Never have a wife. Never have kids. Never, never learn. But I have a lot to offer someone. Two years before, Conrad met Michelle Carter on a trip to Florida. She was one year his junior and lived nearby in Plainville. The two clicked immediately, but for all the bad reasons. Michelle was also a social outcast and she had struggled with depression throughout her whole life. She had also developed a nasty eating disorder and felt increasingly alone in this world. But she was putting on a true show on the outside didn't believe that she was well liked, yet she was voted class clown. She was voted most likely to brighten your day. There was a discrepancy between what she was feeling with this depression and what was actually going on in reality. And Michelle and Conrad weren't alone. They had each other. They considered themselves a couple, albeit a long distance one. They only communicated online or on the phone, even though they lived about an hour's drive away from each other. This is why there are no photos of them together. And they wouldn't flirt with each other or give each other compliments. Most of the time they spoke about their inner struggles and complained about how they had no joy in their lives. I found the relationship rather tragic. When you have two individuals who are both vulnerable for different reasons, who both have been through different traumas, who both um, really are fragile, it can have tragic consequences. On July 12th, 2014, Conrad drove to a Kmart in Fairhaven. There, he rolled up his windows and turned on a water pump, which filled his car with lethal carbon monoxide. Within a few minutes, he was dead. Conrad's family had always known he was struggling with depression and anxiety, but they were not prepared for him to take his own life. Conrad's mental health plummeted during the last months of his life, ever since he made that first video recording. So his family was desperate to understand what pushed him to take such drastic action. Anytime teenagers, anyone minors, they die, it's a tragedy. Whether they die through in, in being involved in some act or whether it's suicide, whatever it is, it's so sad. It feels like once again, we have failed our youth. When the police got involved, they tracked down Conrad's last actions in July 2014. As it turns out, he'd left notes to both his parents and to Michelle. When the police spoke to Michelle, she was an emotional wreck. She constantly posted about how much she missed her boyfriend and she spoke to his family during his wake. She even went on to organize a baseball fundraiser for Conrad. She really looked like the perfect grieving girlfriend. But the police didn't just look at Conrad's notes. They also searched his phone conversations. That's when they discovered the true nature of his girlfriend. So they visited her at her high school, interviewing her by herself as she had just turned 18. We, we were looking into Conrad's unfortunate passing. We did determine a little bit that you probably you, you probably had a lot of contact with him. Yeah. Um, maybe even right up until pretty close to the time in which maybe he stopped having contact with anybody. Michelle said Conrad did talk about taking his own life a lot, but that she told him not to do it, as he had a lot of people in his life who loved him. This is true. She even encouraged him to seek therapy. Except, Michelle quickly did a 180 on her discourse. Before long, she was encouraging Conrad to take his life, and even belittling him for being a coward. It's now or never. You better not be me and say you're going to do this, than purposely get caught. Shockingly, Michelle even texted Conrad about carbon monoxide poisoning. She told him when to do it, and how. Carbon monoxide poisoning. This method of is incredibly uncommon when it comes to adolescents. When the cops asked Michelle if she spoke to Conrad on his last day, she said she didn't. But they literally had transcripts of her telling him to do it and berating him for postponing it for so long. One of her final messages to him was, says, 
you're ready and prepared. All you have to do is turn the generator on and you'll be free and happy. In one of their final exchanges, Carter writes, so it's time. Normally, texts aren't responsible for someone taking their life. But what happens when someone pushes you every single day to do it, knowing you're struggling? Consistently badgered him uh, and, and came very close to belittling him for not being able to stand up and take this action all the way up until the day of his death. It gets worse. The moment Conrad rolled up his windows and turned up the water pump, he started having second thoughts. He wanted to get out of his car, but he panicked and he called Michelle. Guess what Michelle told him? To stop being a wuss and get back in the car. Michelle stayed on the line until she heard Conrad draw his very last breath. Following this horrifying discovery, some fundamental laws were questioned, such as, can someone be charged with murder if they weren't at the scene? She didn't have um, been like a knife, but rather she was the weapon. She speaking to him and what she was telling him and her words were the weapon that caused his death. In the so Michelle was indicted for Conrad's death, deemed involuntary manslaughter, but now Conrad's grieving family and anyone following the case were desperate to understand Michelle's motive. I think what she had to gain by this was attention. People would see her as helpless, as this grieving girlfriend that just went through something incredibly traumatic and rushed to her aid. And that is exactly what happened. Michelle never thought that the police would dig into this teenage and she never expected anyone to read her awful messages. But Conrad did one last thing before he took his life. He deleted every single message on his phone, except those from Michelle. Was he trying to send a message? Michelle's trial was a complicated one. On the first hand, this was a first ever case centered around a person arrested for texting someone to take their own life. On the second hand, Conrad had a medical history of depression and anxiety. The primary argument against this being manslaughter was that this was not encouragement, it was an endorsement of an existing plan. This young man, unfortunately, would have committed whether she opened her mouth. There was another twist. Michelle asked for a bench trial. This means that the judge is the jury. Being a completely new kind of case, Michelle figured having to only convince one person of her innocence might work in her favor. On June 6, 2017, during her trial, the prosecution simply read out her messages. Tonight is the night. It's now or never. You better not be me and say you're gonna do this than purposely get caught. The defense team, on the other hand, kept talking about Conrad's mental health issues, as well as Michelle's. They portrayed her as a vulnerable teen who suffered from depression and and who didn't really know what she was doing. They even said that Michelle was on antidepressants that were making her delusional. She thus genuinely believed that she was helping her boyfriend. But Michelle was prescribed one of the most common antidepressants, which was not associated with manic episodes or such dramatic mind alteration. When the judge reached a conclusion, he mentioned Michelle's last phone conversation with Conrad, the one where she told him to get back in the car and take his life. And Mr. Roy was struggling with his issues. However, he breaks that chain of self-causation by exiting the vehicle. She instructs him to get back into the truck, which she has reason to know is or is becoming a toxic environment inconsistent with human life. Michelle was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. She was sentenced to two and a half years in prison, a much lighter sense than usual for manslaughter cases. This is simply because all she did was talk to Conrad. In January 2020, Michelle was released from prison due to exemplary behavior. She is now 24 and keeping a super low profile. Good luck to her finding a boyfriend now. 
Our last story takes place in Highland Heights, Kentucky. Shayna Hubers was born on April 8, 1991. She was a straight-A student who took extra classes and prided herself on being a perfectionist. But that type of personality can have its downsides. Shayna's family remembers her taking rejection very hard, especially when it came to boys breaking up with her. In 2011, Shayna was working towards a master's degree in school guidance counseling, but that year something threw her off track. She fell in love with 28-year-old Ryan Poston. He sent her a Facebook friend request after noticing her profile picture, and the two immediately hit it off. Ryan was also a perfectionist, workaholic, and a successful lawyer, just like the rest of his family. He was close to his whole family, which included two fathers, after his mother remarried and stayed friends with Ryan's biological dad. Shayna and Ryan's first date was on Shayna's 20th birthday at a Lexington bar, but Ryan wasn't the only one invited. Several of Shayna's friends were there, and they gave a pretty creepy account of what happened that night. Shayna ignored her friends and obsessively focused on Ryan, trying to tie him down into a committed relationship from the very first hours of meeting in person. Ryan was a bit put off by this. Also, he was working in Cincinnati at the time, and he was just at the start of his career. He wasn't going to throw that away for someone he just met. The two did start to date, but they were pulling in opposite directions. Shayna wanted to settle down, and Ryan wanted to take it slowly and focus on his work. Ryan tried to break up with Shayna a few times, but she refused to hear it. She texted her friend, he says he's only with me because I make him feel so awful about it when I cry. They were together on and off for about a year and a half. Desperate to get out, Ryan rallied up his cousin, Carissa, to break it off with Shayna. He hoped that they could speak girl to girl and Shayna would understand why she had to let him go. In a text to Carissa, Ryan complained that Shayna kept coming to his home and refusing to leave. Sheesh. One of their last dates in October 2012 was at a shooting range, as per Ryan's passion for guns. This is what Shayna wrote to her friend afterward. A part of me wanted to turn around and shoot him. I wonder why he's taking me on dates and stuff, lol. I'm not going to turn down learning to shoot a gun, haha. <laughs> if that's not downright creepy, I don't know what is. By October 2012, Ryan was done with Shayna but their on and off relationship meant that he hadn't officially broken up with her, nor had his cousin. Ryan set up a date with another woman, Audrey Bolte, who was that year's Miss Ohio, but he didn't tell Shayna about it. He was just hoping that this would convince her to back off. Tragically, it did the exact opposite. Shayna found out about their date through Facebook and she was infuriated. Wait till you hear how she found out. She noticed Ryan had a new Facebook friend. She saw it was a woman and she befriended her. Then she talked to her and faked friendship so as to find out about her plans that week. That's how she knew she was going to meet Ryan. Afterward, she became desperate to get Ryan back. She would text him fake emergency situations to have him come to her apartment. On October 12th, she feigned a heart attack and texted him to visit. When he didn't, she visited his flat just before he was supposed to leave for his date. Ryan never made it out of his apartment. County 911. Ma'am, I killed my boyfriend in self-defense. What did you kill him with? I got a loaded gun in the house. Can you tell me where the gun is right now? The gun is in the house. I laid it on the bookshelf. Where are you? I'm standing about 10 feet from his dead body. Okay, are you sure that he is dead? He's dead, ma'am. He's completely dead. Shayna said she started pleading with the dispatcher, saying she was not a murderer. She just had to save her life from her monstrous boyfriend. She even added that Ryan had hit her before. She concocted the story in the 15 minutes between killing Ryan and calling 911. When the paramedics arrived, they found that Ryan had been six times. Outrageously, Shayna said she shot him four times. Then when she saw him twitching on the floor, she shot him two more times because he was going to die anyway. What? Shayna was arrested at the scene. 
During the interrogation, Shayna spoke by herself for hours without being prompted by the cops. Possession with guns killed him. You know, I would have never, I'm so Democrat, I would have never touched a gun in my life. Until I did. Yep, she blamed Ryan for getting murdered. She also portrayed herself as a victim of his abuse and as an angel of mercy for fatally shooting Ryan when he was twitching. During her trial, it was revealed that Shayna broke into Ryan's house that evening. Ryan also hadn't touched the gun that day. Ryan's neighbors also reported hearing gunshots, but no fight or struggle. So Shayna took him by surprise. After the trial, Shayna apologized to her family for having to spend so much money on attorneys. She never said sorry to Ryan or his family. In 2015, Shayna was sentenced to 40 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder. Just like in our first case, Shayna continued to act like a victim, disappointed by the trial's outcome. Ryan's family, ironically, a family of attorneys, were pleased with the verdict, though. Ryan believed in the justice system, always, always, and it has not failed him. Still, isn't it truly sad when the killer never acknowledges their guilt? Thanks for watching, you guys. Hey, don't be shy. Make sure you like this video and subscribe for more. Looking at a fragile old lady, would you ever expect her to be able to turn into a cold-blooded murderer? Today, we're talking about Dorothea Puente, who took the lives of countless people and buried them in her back yard. Then we're taking a look at Tamara Samsonova, who killed not just her husband, but also her best friend in a fit of rage. Lastly, we're introducing you to Sandra Lane, also known as the Killer Granny, who gave grandparents everywhere a bad name. I used to be a very good person at one time. Ms. Marzano, what can you tell us about the murders? Are you involved in any way? Excuse me, excuse me. To the outside world, Dorothea Puente was the kindest, most gentle old lady you could ever hope to run into. But what most people couldn't tell by the looks of her was the darkness that she had hidden within. Born in San Bernardino County, California, Dorothea had a rough childhood to say the least. Both of her parents were chronic alcoholics who abused her in their fits of rage. As a young girl, Dorothea was often left to fend for herself. Sometimes she would go days without eating because her parents would be too occupied with their own selves and their addictions. Her father died of tuberculosis when she was just eight years old, and only a few days later, her mother died in a motorcycle crash due to heavy intoxication. Along with her siblings, Dorothea was sent to an orphanage and was later taken in by some relatives. She had already learned to fend for herself at that point. When she was 16 years old, Dorothea started doing sex work in a motel to make some money to support herself. To make herself sound interesting, she would make up different identities and lie to people about things like coming from a family of 18 children. Somehow, she made her way safely into adulthood when she started seeing 22-year-old soldier Fred McFall. And just after a few months of dating, the couple got married in Reno. Again, Dorothea lied about her name on their marriage certificate and pretended to be a 30-year-old woman named Cheryl Lee A. Rossilli. Her bad luck followed her into her marriage. Two years in, her husband passed away due to a heart attack. To cope with her husband's loss and all the financial burden that followed, Dorothea started forging checks. However, she ended up getting caught red-handed and was sentenced to a year in jail. She only served six months and was eligible for parole. But as soon as she got out of jail, she found a new man. Despite having a short-lived relationship, Dorothea became pregnant. When she had her baby girl, she felt she wasn't ready to be a mom, so she gave her up for adoption. And a few years on from that, she married a new man named Axel Johansson. And that was the start of a violent relationship that brought out the ugly side of Dorothea like no other. What's strange is that despite all of this, she continued her street work. 
When the police caught her at a brothel, she was sentenced to 90 days. This is when Dorothea really started spiraling out of control. She began consuming illegal substances and getting into trouble with authorities. This is likely what led to the end of her marriage. But soon she married another man named Roberto Puente. Sadly, Roberto ended up cheating on Dorothea multiple times and that's how their relationship ended. Dorothea was 40 years old at this point and this is when she chose to go through a complete transformation. Becoming a devout Christian and working as a nurse's aide, she took care of disabled and elderly people in their homes. She progressed in her career and opened a boarding house for the elderly inside her own home. She would let them stay as tenants. It seemed like she had turned her life around, but no. This is where her crimes went up a notch. She started doing the most despicable things you could ever think of. When one of her tenants named Ruth Monroe passed away in Dorothea's house, people didn't think much of it. The authorities ruled the death as a self-infliction after finding traces of illegal substances in her body. When we first met her, she seemed like a nice person, real friendly. Mom had a little bit of money and Dorothea was talking about opening a restaurant, the little cafe at the corner bar. So her and mom went in on it together. But Dorothea kept saying that it wasn't making money. She kept hitting her for more money, more money. Mom didn't want to live alone. So she had us move her into Dorothea's place as a roommate. Everyone knew that Ruth was not an alcoholic and Dorothea had agreed to adopt her. The two had grown quite close when she lived at the boarding house and Ruth, whom she lovingly called Chief, would do anything that Dorothea asked her to. She would water her plants, take out her trash, and even help her cover her basement floor with concrete slabs. So what happened to her? I would stop by there every day after work and everything was fine up until the last three days. The last three days, I saw mom had a drink in her hand. And my mom didn't drink. Alcohol actually bothered mom. She was allergic to alcohol. And she said Dorothea had fixed her a drink to calm her nerves. That next morning, six o'clock in the morning, was when I got the phone call from my sister saying that my mom died. Did Dorothea get rid of her when she stopped being useful to her? The police returned back a month later with a load of evidence to prove that it wasn't substance abuse that killed Ruth, but Dorothea had drugged her and stolen from her, which was a pattern she had developed with her clients. All of them would drop dead for no reason, with their benefit checks being cashed by Dorothea. When they did the autopsy, the amount of drugs that were in my mother were all at toxic levels. She poisoned her. And I think it was over time with those drinks, little by little, putting it in her system. After being sent to jail once again, Dorothea spent her time talking to a pen pal that she had found. And once she was released in 1985, the man named Everson Gilmouth was the one to come out and pick her up, expecting to get married to who he thought was the love of his life. But like Clockworth, Gilmouth disappeared a few months later. And that was the same time when Dorothea hired a new worker to help her with renovations around the house, which included constructing a long box with a lid that she claimed was for trash. The next day, she asked her worker to load the now full box into her truck so they could dump it on the side of the road. Well, the only thing that that box contained was Gilmouth's dead body. Dorothea got away with the crime, and the body wasn't discovered until 1986, when a fisherman saw it floating in the water. It took authorities around three more years to identify Gilmouth, and in a guise to protect herself, Dorothea kept writing letters to him, pretending that everything was okay, so his family would never suspect her. At the same time, she kept collecting his pension, since that's why she started the relationship in the first place. She knew all the magic words to say to these government officials or people working for social services. Remember, record keeping in 1985 is not what it is today. She had been married four times. At various times, her married name was Dorothea McCall, Dorothea Johansson, 
Dorothea Montalvo. So sometimes law enforcement agencies didn't exactly know exactly what somebody had on their record. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. While Gilmel's body was still being identified by the police, Dorothea continued her boarding house scam, and that's what eventually got her into trouble. An officer went over to 1426 F Street to take a missing persons report. Spoke to Dorothea, spoke to everybody, and they all said the same thing, that Bert had left with a relative. All of them, same story. But one of the boarders slipped the officer a note. In November 1988, the police came to her house looking for 51-year-old Alvaro Montoya, a disabled man who had decided to stay in Dorothea's home before mysteriously disappearing. There's one of two things I can surmise, okay? And that is, Mr. Montoya is dead. No, he's not. Okay, I'm gonna miss that. I'm just saying, let me just, I'm trying to surmise this and then we'll try to clear this up. That he is dead. And that either he, either either John McCauley or, or Mer, what is it, Melvin? Mervin. Mervin. John. Either killed him. Or that maybe he meant foul play by your hands. That's, that's, that's my alternatives. I don't know. But my other alternative is that the fact that somewhere in that backyard, Dorothea, that he's lying, maybe along with other people. No. Okay. And I'm also going to tell you that we had the same information a year ago. A year a ago. A year ago? Yes. A year ago. So what I'm telling you is not new to me. Monday, can I hire a a contractor to go in and tear everything down and dig it up to prove to you that there's nobody there? If, there, if there any digging has to be done, we're going to do the digging. Oh, okay. okay. In search of Montoya, the police found a patch of disturbed soil in Dorothea's garden. And when they dug it up, lo and behold, there was Alvaro's body rotting away. At one point, I started finding pieces of garbage, eggshells, um, paper, cigarette butts. As I was digging, I looked up, I saw Dorothea standing out on the balcony on the second floor. And she was just staring at me. And then I started finding pieces of cloth and I would pull them up and they were kind of a light pinkish color. And I kept pulling these pieces of cloth up. So I set them in a pile. My shovel had struck something hard. I decided to get down in the hole, brace myself, grab this with my hands and yank on it. And when it broke loose, I could see it had a ball in the end and it was a femur bone. It was a human femur bone. And not just that, but the police also found a bunch of other bodies buried away in the same patch, proving that the seemingly kind landlady was actually a cold-blooded murderer who wanted nothing but money out of her tenants. You know what I heard? I heard, hey, Dorothea, over at 1426 F Street, killing people and burying them in their backyard. Um, How do you explain the body in the backyard? I don't Two and know. a half feet down, I don't with know. clothing I don't and everything know. with it. How? When you find out how old it is and see that I didn't have anything to do with that, Dorothea? Sir, I don't know anything. I'm going to ask you right now again. Are there any other bodies no. in your backyard? Not that I didn't even know that one was there. The police charged Dorothea with a total of nine murders, and she ended up receiving two death sentences. During her trial, it was found that she tortured her tenants by overdosing them, and once they would die, she would hire workers to help her bury the bodies and get rid of the evidence. And since most of her victims were addicts and homeless people, no one really noticed their disappearance, which just goes to show how diabolical she really was. The evidence was just overwhelming at this point. And while a group of people believed that the old woman should be let go and treated a little gently because of her age, the judge completely ruled against it. And Dorothea was sent to Chowchilla Women's Prison, where she passed away in March 2011 at the age of 82. A fitting end to a horrific tale. 
But what's strange is that until the very end, Dorothea maintained her innocence, claiming that all her tenants had died because of either natural causes or the consequences of their own addictions. Known to the world as the Granny Ripper, Tamara Samsonova was nothing but pure evil. In 2015, the world was stunned to know that this elderly lady, who looked like she could barely hurt a fly, had committed some of the most heinous crimes one could ever imagine. Most of us have subconsciously created an image of how a serial killer should look like, but the truth is, one size doesn't fit all. And Tamara certainly didn't fit into any stereotype. Tamara's crimes came to light in 2015 when it was discovered that she was behind a string of brutal murders. Tamara was from Moscow. She lived in St. Petersburg with her husband, Alexei Samsonova, and worked for a travel agency. Everything in her life seemed completely okay until one day, her husband mysteriously disappeared. Tamara then started making rounds to the local police, begging them to look for him. Sadly though, the investigation led nowhere, and the case turned cold. After her husband was presumed dead, Tamara decided to rent out a room in her apartment. And for a while, everything was fine. But then, in September 2003, she ended up murdering one of her tenants in a fit of rage. The victim was a 44-year-old man from Norilsk, and Tamara hid his body by dismembering it and chucking away the pieces on the streets near her house. Following that, her temper only worsened. She became friends with 79-year-old Valentina Nikolaevna Ulanova, who agreed to let Tamara move into her house while her place was being renovated. The two developed a great friendship and Tamara loved living at her place. So much so that she just didn't want to move out. Soon enough, Ulanova got tired of the whole arrangement and asked her to move out. This didn't sit well with Tamara, who decided to poison the woman she called her friend, the woman who had let her into her house when she needed help. Tamara somehow convinced the pharmacist to sell her phenazepam, a sedative used to treat mental disorders. She put a ton of it in Ulanova's salad that she had bought for her under the guise as a peace offering to resolve their conflict. Tamara then took care of Ulanova's body by chopping her up into pieces with two knives and a saw. She first chopped off her head and then sawed her in half. She then took multiple trips to put pieces of her body in bags and scattered them around to make sure that no one traced the murder back to her. But for some odd reason, she left pieces of her corpse lying around her house. This blunder is what sealed her fate for good. It was in July 2015 when a man stumbled upon a body with severed limbs wrapped in a bathroom curtain at a pond by Ulanova's house. The body was identified a day later, and of course, the police traced it all down to Tamara. They then broke into her house, finding traces of Ulanova's blood in her bathroom, and the final nail in the coffin was her missing shower curtain. And all of this was enough for Tamara to be arrested immediately. An investigation was launched, and the police came across footage of Tamara dragging a big garbage bag outside of her apartment, proving her to be guilty without any doubt. Soon enough, the police also linked the murder of her 44-year-old tenant to her, and it was also suspected that Tamara had killed her own husband before pretending he had gone missing. Tamara admitted to killing her tenant in her diary, writing, I killed my tenant, Voldaya, cut him into pieces in the bathroom with a knife, put the pieces of his body in plastic bags, and threw them away. The journal also contained a bunch of entries that revealed that Tamara had murdered 10 other people. According to the neighbors, she had previously spent time in a psychiatric hospital and often lied about her identity for unknown reasons. 
The police also discovered a host of ebooks on black magic and astrology, which made this case all the more bizarre. When questioned, though, she admitted to all of her crimes, even going into detail about Ulanova's murder, saying that she had given her an overdose of sleeping pills and dispersed her body while she was still alive. When asked why she killed her friend, Tamara claimed that they broke out into a disagreement over unwashed dishes, and that is what unhinged her. In her first court appearance, Tamara made it look like she was well prepared for this day, saying that she had been waiting 10 years for this moment to come and that it was all deliberate. Her crimes, as well as the circumstances that led to her arrest. Throughout her trial, she was always confused and erratic, leading the authorities to believe that she was mentally unstable. As the investigations went on, even more brutal details came to light as the police found Tamara guilty of feeding on her victims and taking part in cannibalism. All of her victims were found to have their lungs removed, which Tamara admitted to eating. And while she admitted to 13 crimes, the police believed that the number could have been as high as 21. She was ultimately declared mentally competent, and instead of being sent to jail for her crimes, Tamara was sent to multiple psychiatric hospitals, where she remains to this day. She has been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, which is what led her to ruthlessly kill and dismember without conscience. Andrew Lane deserves the maximum penalty allowed. Please do not show mercy on her. It was an emotional day in the court. Sandra Lane looking shocked by the very real possibility that she will die in prison. I know what I've done. I can't take it back. Popularly known as the granny with a gun, Sandra Lane brutally took the life of her own grandson. A small, frail, 74-year-old woman, Sandra Lane's neighbors knew her as a sweet old lady who loved her family more than anything else. So no one could have seen it coming when she ended up killing one of her own in a fit of rage. So, what went down? I wonder if you really felt so violated and so afraid and a need to shoot. Why did you keep shooting him? In May 2012, 17-year-old Jonathan Hoffman was shot three times in the abdomen, once in his chest and once again in his arm. The injuries he had sustained were too much for him to handle and he passed away on the spot. The perpetrator of the crime? His very own grandmother, who claimed to have done this for his own good. Jonathan had moved into his grandmother's house in 2012 when things at his home had gotten too overwhelming for him to handle. His sister had developed brain cancer, which is why his parents made the difficult decision of moving to Arizona to get her the treatment that she needed. But Jonathan didn't want to move. He didn't want his life to be uprooted, so he argued to stay back in Michigan. This led to a huge fight at home. It was then that Grandma Sandra offered to take him in. Sandra Lane was a 74-year-old retired school teacher who wanted to give her grandson the life he wanted. But what she hadn't realized was that, like any other teenager, Jonathan was going through a rebellious phase. He had a substance abuse problem and was addicted to synthetic marijuana. He had started using it way before things at home started getting bad. But Sandra was determined to fix things. She was on a mission to get Jonathan to pay attention in school, fix his grades, graduate on time, and start living a healthier life. But at the end of the day, she couldn't put a stop to his substance abuse. The final straw came when Jonathan called 911 while he was tripping on mushrooms, convincing the dispatchers that he was dying. He was shifted to the hospital while his mother flew in from Arizona, and Sandra just didn't know how to tell her daughter that this was all too much for her. Sick and tired of her grandson's constant hallucinogenic trips and rowdy behavior, she told his mother to take him back with her. It was later claimed by Jonathan's mother that no such conversation ever took place and Sandra was still very determined to help the young boy get back on track. Jonathan was extremely defiant at this point. 
He was constantly consuming and during one of his binges, the police caught him with a substance in his car and he was put on probation for regular testing. During all of this, there was growing tension between the two. The grandfather was also present and saw what was happening in the house, but he chose to stay out of all arguments. But things just seemed to spiral out of control due to Jonathan's extremely volatile attitude. During one fight, things got so bad that Sandra had to call the police to keep the boy from harming her in any way. So it was evident that Sandra couldn't handle the situation anymore. The best thing to do at this point would have been to send her grandson to rehab, or she could have forced his parents to come back home, or his teachers could have been involved. But instead, she decided to take matters into her own hands in the worst way possible. Sandra went ahead and got herself a semi-automatic gun. She started taking shooting lessons at the gun range and hid the whole thing from Jonathan and her husband, both of whom didn't know there was a gun hidden in their house. After Jonathan failed one of his court-mandated tests, he was afraid and wanted to move to Arizona to be with his parents. However, the police stopped him from doing so. Sandra kept him under house arrest, hoping to detox him from the substances. I called 911 and I told him I hear gunfire back here. Berger has lived next door to Fred and Sandra for 14 years. He was one of the last people to talk with 17-year-old Jonathan Hoffman before Lane killed him. I figured I would call Fred and find out if he heard the same thing. But the young man answered the phone and said, my grandmother just shot me in the chest. In the midst of the rising tensions and the daily squabbles at home, Jonathan decided to step out of the house to meet a friend. Sandra tried to force him back. He outrightly refused and continued to get ready. Finding no other option, Sandra brought out the gun to scare the young boy into obedience. To her surprise, Jonathan was unfazed and still adamant to leave. She proceeded to fire the gun again and again, shooting him multiple times at point blank range. One of the neighbors heard the gunshot and immediately called 911. Jonathan tried to run for his life, but his grandma ran after him and shot him down making sure he was dead. The poor boy begged for help, but Sandra refused to listen, shooting him even when he was down on the ground, unable to move. What are you trying to do? Get away. Stop him. So you're trying to get away from him. And why are you trying to get away from him? Listen. <laughs> you're scared. What are you scared about? <laughs> Jonathan made one last ditch effort to save his life and called 911 to ask for help. In the recordings, he was heard talking about how his grandmother was shooting him before his voice trailed off and Sandra can be heard yelling in the background. When the police arrived, the evidence against Sandra was too overwhelming to negate. Jonathan had died by then. She ended up admitting to her crime, saying that she had done it out of self-defense when the two had gotten into an explosive altercation. Jonathan's phone call might not have been able to save his life, but it certainly put his murderer behind bars 
for good. Sandra Lane is pure evil, and if given the opportunity, would surely kill again. She has no remorse or conscience. Her only concerns are for herself. I don't know what else to say. I just don't know. I didn't want to die in jail. Her person, please. I don't know what to do in my life. I'm so sorry. I apologize. The 911 recordings were enough for the court to incriminate her for her brutal murder, sentencing her to 20 to 40 years in jail with no possibility of parole, despite her constant appeals. Even Jonathan's parents went on to call Sandra pure evil. According to Jennifer, Sandra's daughter, her mother was capable of killing even more people if she was ever released. She deserved a life sentence and uh... She's locked away forever and can't hurt anybody else. How would you have described Sandra Lane before all this? Uh, she was always a thorn in my side, to be very honest. She was very difficult, um, uh, very meddlesome, very controlling, and uh, I never liked her. Do you think Sandra acted out after losing her patience, or was she just really selfish? Do you believe schizophrenia was the only driving force that turned Tamara into a mass murderer? Did society fail Dorothea? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section.